We're going to continue on, and we got some questions here. One of them, which is, I have a hard time grasping the concept of final decree. Qadr in Islam. Qadr in Islam. Uh, several ways. I mean, um, this can never be a short conversation, as you know, predestination. If God already knows what I'm going to do, how is it my fault? If God is all powerful, then I'm not really doing anything. Somebody else. And, and if someone has a hard time understanding that, um, you know, if, it, if it's the first problem, it's, if God's under complete control, then I can't be held responsible. If somebody was having a conversation like that with me, the first thing I'd do is slap him. Why'd you slap me? It's like, it wasn't me, it was God's decree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you can't blame me for that because it was predestined. <laughs> that wouldn't work. <laughs> Would they buy that? Would they be happy with that? No, not no. Because now I'm saying it's not my fault, bro. It's God's decree. They even know that at a practical level, this makes no sense. They know that. But you know why they believe it? Or they want to believe that? Or they want to argue that? Because they want to do some bad things and they don't want to be held responsible. Just like I just did something bad, and I wouldn't really do that, but I'm demonstrating. <laughs> that they don't want to be held responsible. That's the, that's the psychological root of this problem. The second thing I'd share is I have a lecture online somewhere. I don't know how everything I say ends up on YouTube, but I have a lecture there somewhere on the story of Adam alayhi salam. Because the Qur'an does not make a chapter out of decree. Rather, the Qur'an teaches the lessons of decree from the story of the first human being. Teaching us that if there was, one hum if there was any human being that had the right to ask, Hey, you already knew I was going to end up on earth. What do you mean I ate from the tree as punishment, I got to go on the earth? You already knew all of that. If there was any human being who could have argued God's decree is entrapment, who could it have been? Adam alayhi salam. We learn the solution to this problem in the Qur'an from Adam alayhi salam. And his story says that a careful study of his story little by little is very important. And at the same time, you know what shaitan said? Oh, you planned this whole thing against me. Ah, you made me slip. So the one who says God decreed me to slip is who? The devil. The devil. The one who says, I was the one who was wrong. Rabbana zalamna anfusana. We wronged ourselves. Not God wronged us. We wronged ourselves. If He doesn't forgive us and show us mercy, we'll be from the losers. The one who admits his own fault is Adam. The one who refuses to admit his fault and says it's God's fault is... The devil. The devil. That's what we're learning in the first human being story. No surprise, they call this the oldest problem in philosophy. The devil wants to continue what he... His failure, he wants to... Inflict, inject that virus into us. It's the oldest problem in philosophy because that's shaitan's problem. Predestination was shaitan's problem. You know? The third thing, if somebody is really philosophically inclined, you know, some of our, use, uh, our listeners, our viewers, uh, they can understand simple arguments and that's enough for them. And mm -hmm. some are very, very deeply philosophically inclined and they like to read you know, deeper literature on these kinds of things. For them, there's a book I recommend. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, a, a senior in our community in Dallas, uh, wrote the book, he's a sociologist, an anthropologist, a Muslim scholar by the name of Salahuddin. He wrote a book called God, Islam, and the Skeptic Mind. I think it's a fantastic book. I read it on my trip to London, I had nine hours to kill. And it's, it's a collection of discussions that college students had with him about their you know, skepticism of belief in God, predestination, sharia, etc., etc. And he collected all of them in one book. And just a transcript of those conversations. It's very, very well done. I really appreciate it, and it, I think for like, especially college students and, and uh, you know, students that start having problems with Islam philosophically once they take a couple of philosophy courses in college, that book is a great, great resource. What's it called again? God, Islam, and the Skeptic Mind by Salahuddin. We were with our brother Chris, and I don't know if you remember, and he asked the same question to you. We were having lunch, mm -hmm. and you gave an analogy, a story. Can you share that with us? Do you remember that? Sure, analogy? I remember the A and the B. Yes, the two mm -hmm. lists and the party. Yeah, yes, I can share that analogy with you. Um, that's actually the way my teacher explained it to me because I used to have the same question. And, you know, people different, different people are satisfied different ways. I was satisfied with that explanation. He was satisfied with that also. Yeah. Okay, so I'll share it with you. Now imagine that I'm throwing a party. Yeah. And I make two guest lists, people I'm going to invite. Guest list A and guest list B. Guest list A, I... Just, it's secret. These are the people I'm going to invite, and nobody knows who's on this list. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. It's a secret list. Guest list B is open. And I say to people, if you want to be on B, here's what you got to do. I give them a few to-do lists, and if you do these things, you can get on guest list B. Now here you are, you want to come to my party. You got two options. Maybe I'm on guest list A, I don't know. 
Or maybe I should try to get on guest list B. If you say, well, I'm not going to bother trying to get on B, I'm probably already on A. You know what that proves? That proves you didn't really want to go to the party that bad. Because mm -hmm. you're gambling, aren't you? But if you say, you know what, maybe I am on A, but maybe I'm not. But I really want to go to this party. What should I do? Whatever tasks there are to get guarantee my spot on guest list, B. This is basically how guidance works, predestination works. Allah decides who's going to go to hell and who's going to go to heaven. There's a secret list. But there's also an open list. Do this, 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 you, got, you get on guest list A. And there's some people Allah will decide to guide, they're over here. Amazing thing, you get to the party, guess what you realize? Your name is actually on both lists. And all the people who signed up on B were already on A. And all the people that didn't sign up for B weren't on A either. Meaning Allah, myst Allah mysteriously guides some people, but those are the people that do the right things anyway. Allah mysteriously decides some people don't deserve guidance. Well, you know what? They're the ones who actually don't do anything to deserve guidance anyway. So both of those things. In philosophy, you could say it's God's will and human effort. They come together in Islam. They come together. And the way they come together in the Qur'an, where this whole thing comes from, is actually one word in the Qur'an. It's in the Fatiha. Iyaka nasta'in. We say the word Iyaka nasta'in, which translates your help we seek or only your help do we seek, you're probably sure you've heard that translation before. The word nasta'in in Arabic is important here. Different kinds of asking for help. I'll very quickly explain. If I had a flat tire, and I sit in the car listening to the radio, you walk by and say, hey buddy, could you help me change the tire please? I'll pop the trunk for you. And I sit in the car while you're changing my tire. That's asking for help, but that's a pretty retarded way of asking for help. Now imagine I had a flat tire, I got out myself, I pulled out the jack, I'm trying to crank up the car, but I'm not strong enough. You walk by and say, hey Eddie, you look like you work out. Come on, help me out over here. I put effort in, and then I asked you for help. That's called nasta'in. Asta'inuka, I'm putting effort in already. And now on top of that, I'm asking you for help. You know what we learned from that? The only time you and I have a right to ask Allah for help is when we do what first? Put effort in. If we don't put effort in, we have no right to ask God for help. This is what Allah does over and over and over again. The companions go all the way to the battle of Badr. The angels arrive after that. The angels are not there ahead of time saying, Hey, we've been here since 3 o'clock, where you guys been? No, no, no. You gotta make the effort first, then the help arrives. What happens with Ibrahim a.s.? He's thrown in a fire first, then it's cooled. Human effort first, Allah's help later. But both of those things come together. And that's essentially what predestination is. Once you put the effort in, Allah's, Allah's decree is that you will be guided. Last minute that we have for our brothers in humanity, the not yet Muslims, and even the Muslims who now they've been away from Islam, yeah. and they are coming back. They watch some of our shows, they like what we have to say. What advice do you give to them, to the not yet Muslim and the Muslim, some of the basic things they can do right now to get back on track, or to get on track? Number one, you are in, in the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean... Gosh, if you make tawbah now, if you repent to God now, and you change, you just, you don't even do anything yet. You just sincerely turn to God and say, I'm turning back to you. I'm going to change my ways for you. Then you are in a better position than any scholar, any worshiper, any Muslim on the planet. Why? Because your slate is entirely clean. That's what tawbah is. And not only that, Allah adds another incentive. Maybe you have this endless mountain of sin behind you. And you're wondering, how could I just get rid of all of that? God's promise he takes those mountains of sins, فَأُولَيْكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّعَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ Surah Al-Furqan, 25th Surah. Those are the people, the ones who sincerely repent to God, or turn, turn back to God, He will take all of their endless mountains of evil deeds and convert them to good deeds, just because they repented. So not only are you starting at zero sin, you're starting at billions of good deeds, because all of your billions of bad deeds have actually been converted, just from that one act. This is the opportunity you're sitting on. And Allah knows the one who procrastinates, the one who holds back. And Allah describes that person on Judgment Day, and that person says, they're about to go into paradise, and a wall is dropped. And they're like, what happened? We were gonna come. And the, one of the first responses is, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ فَتَنْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَتَرَبَّصْتُمْ You put yourselves on trial, you, you kept yourselves from coming forward, and you procrastinated. You said, ah, I got some time. After this weekend, one last party, then I'll change. One more Ramadan, then I'm good. One more, well, just a little bit more. Just a couple more semesters, and then I'll stop. You were the, you were the people that procrastinated. So, well, it's dropped. 
you can't be from us anymore. So this is the opportunity you have to avail now. You, have, you and I have no time left. There's no time like now to make, make tawbah. So don't, don't think you have time left. I shouldn't think I have time left. This is why the Prophet Wasallam used, I mean, look at him. His status compared to us. He used to make tawbah to Allah. He used to repent to God, ask Allah for forgiveness hundreds of times every day. For what reason? Because he knows. Even all, first of all, if a mistake has happened, it's converted to zero. And all the mistakes are turned into good deeds. Why not ask for forgiveness all the time? Great advice.